Welcome back to the second video on animal communication this week. So in the first video, we've been looking at the design features of human language and specifically we've been looking at Hockett's 13 design features of human language and to what degree these might also be shared by other non-human species. And we've seen, for example, that there are other animals like the honeybees that in their dance show displacement and that Perhaps with questions about them, there are chances that other animals have features such as discreteness or perhaps even something approaching recursion, even though we've seen that's not quite like the true recursion that we find in humans that allows us to do many, many more things. Another thing that we also saw in that video is that even though many of these abilities might be shared with other animals, not all of them are. So there's some abilities that only humans seem to have. And there's also the fact that where some of these features are found also in other animals, often they're more limited and less generalized than they are in the use that they find in human language. So in the first part of this video, we'll be looking at some of the more glaring differences that exist, of course, between humans and between other species that show that we are sort of specially adapted in certain ways for some of these design features of language and then we'll move on to look at a couple of case studies of animals that have some linguistic related abilities that perhaps might seem impressive and that perhaps could be instructive about the question whether animals are able to learn language. Now, if you compare a human to some of the more closely related other primates, then there are some glaring obvious differences. And I'm not talking about the fact that one of them is covered in fur head to toe and the other one barely is. I'm talking about the fact that our head sits at almost a 90 degree angle while that of other primates doesn't. That of other primates is stretched out much more forward. And if you look on the inside, that has quite some dramatic effects together with some other changes that happen in that anatomy of the speech tract. So let's have a look at a sagittal cross section comparing the vocal tract anatomy of a orangutan, a chimpanzee, and a human. Now, if we compare the vocal tract anatomy of a orangutan here shown on the left, labeled A, a chimpanzee labeled B in the middle, and a human labeled C on the right, then one of the first things that we can see is that the larynx is lowered. So humans have a lower larynx, and we can see that the larynx is the human down here in the chimpanzee. It's here directly at the root of the tongue. And then in the orangutan also, it's here directly at the root of the tongue. A thing that's much less visible here is that humans have a longer mandible. So our mandible is the jawbone that has expanded all the way down here and goes all the way around and comes all the way back up. That in humans is significantly longer than it is in other primates. Then something that is also perhaps difficult to estimate from these cross sections is that humans actually have a larger tongue. So if you measure the total volume of this thing here of the tongue, then for humans this will be bigger than for the chimpanzee and the orangutan. And in addition, the human tongue is more bunched up and actually rounded in comparison to the tongue of other primates or indeed most other animals that have a tongue. And then tied to the size of the bundable and the bunching of the tongue, we have a different arrangement in terms of the angle relative of the spine and the windpipe to the extrusions of our head. So if you follow the wind up here, then you get this 90 degree angle almost, whilst in the chimpanzee, you have sort of a much more gentle angle. And in the orangutan, you almost have a straight line passing through here. So we have a 90 degree bend from the pharynx to the oronasal cavities. Now we humans are pretty unique in having this 90 degree bend from the pharynx out through the oronasal cavity. And that of course contributes to some of the acoustic properties that our speech tract has, but it also opens everything up and allows us to have more space to move around with the various articulators in our mouth, to move around with the sponged up tongue, to move around with the mandible and create more space inside of the mouth and also to move the velum. So the velum 
that sits at the back here and can close off the passage to the nasal cavity is not voluntarily controlled in the orangutan and in the chimpanzee. In fact, it's kind of an interaction between the tongue. If the tongue moves up, then it presses the velum against the back of the pharynx and the nasal cavity will be closed off. Whilst in the human, we have deliberate control over it and that's catered for by having more space when we introduce this 90 degree bend. So this is in effect responsible for giving us control over two separate resonating cavities. We can use the nasal cavity in producing nasal sounds as distinct from producing oral sounds where we close off the nasal cavity voluntarily, which is something that other primates cannot do when they vocalize. So of course, the descended larynx is one of the features that you will probably have known about before and is one of the really important features and one of the features that is very illustrative of how much language means and how much humans have to sacrifice to have language in the way that we have it or to have speech rather. So in humans, the larynx rests low in the throat and having the larynx rest low in the throat allows us to have more vocal tract shape. You can imagine if our larynx wasn't down here but was rather up there pressed against the root of our tongue, then we couldn't retract our tongue to make all these wonderful back sounds as we find them in beautiful words like book or krochechaste. So a low larynx allows for a wider range of vocal tract shapes. And allowing more vocal tract shapes means more varied and distinctive speech sounds, which of course is a massive boon to communication. And in fact, it seems to be such a big boon to communication that we've evolved this ability in spite of its inherent dangers. So there's a good reason that a lot of other animals don't have a descended larynx. If your larynx sits up here by the root of your tongue, then if you swallow something and it accidentally closes off your windpipe, you can just sort of very simply cough it up or you can move your tongue a little bit and you can dislodge it. And so it's almost impossible for a chimpanzee or a yangitan to choke to death. Whilst for a human, that is a very, very real danger. And in fact, you can see that babies are kind of more immune to that because their larynx is not descended here. So as you see in this picture of a baby that's nine months old, the larynx is kind of in a similar position as it is for the chimpanzee here. Whilst then for the adult human, it's much lower in the third. So you can imagine if something gets dislodged here, it's very hard to get out. Whilst here, that's not so much trouble. So the ability to produce speech and the variety of speech sounds that we have seems to be such an evolutionary boost that it's quite worth taking the risk of potentially choking to death on something for that. That is, if you ask me, pretty cool. And then if we move into the cognitive realm, we see that humans, of course, also have a number of cognitive abilities that cater specifically to language. And evidence for this can come from different domains. For example, in the neurological domain, looking at language disorders like Broca's and Wernicke's aphasia, we have discovered that there seem to be specific structures in the brain that are there to support certain tasks in language. Looking at language acquisition, we saw that there seems to be a specific plan and a sensitive period for acquiring language. We saw that, for example, in the disruption of learning experienced by feral children like Jeannie. In fact, all throughout the schools, we have seen many instances where we seem to have special cognitive abilities that underlie some of these design features of human language. Now, if you remember the nature versus nurture debate, then you know that some people believe that language is acquired through learning. And that implies that if we train an animal, it might just succeed at acquiring a language. Now, as you'll probably be aware of, people have been trying to do exactly that for quite some time, especially focused on other primates. So people have been trying to teach chimpanzees like Nimchimsky, for example, to essentially speak a sign language, because of course speech is not possible with the missing adjustments to the articulators. However, in spite of the fact that I'm a great personal fan of Nimchimsky and that we could talk for an entire video probably about just one of those studies with chimpanzees. These are quite familiar to people and they're quite easily accessible. So instead here, I want to focus on some other, perhaps less well-known cases where animals have been taught some linguistic related abilities and where people have come to an evaluation or where the media have often claimed that this shows that essentially these animals are able to learn language to some degree. Now, the first case that I want to look at is a gray parrot called Alex. And before I say anything about Alex, 
I just want to play you a little clip from a news report about Alex's special linguistic ability. So go and have a look. What matter? Whoa! That's right, you're a good Alex guy. Alex can answer different questions about the same object. What shape? Four. Corner. Four corner, good boy. Go Alex hasn't just learned to say a certain word when he sees Look a particular object. He's How paying many? attention to the questions. How many? That's right. You're a good you boy. Go no, you sweetie. No, you can't go back yet. You got to... want some water? All right. Do you want some water? Or are you just asking to interrupt? Are you just asking to interrupt? Look. What color bigger? What color bigger? Green. Green. Oh, you're a good go boy. Look. Hey, look, can you tell me? On the tray, how many green block? How many green block? Look on this the tray, how many green logic problem. block? Alex can't just count up all the green things, and he can't just count up all the blocks. Alex has never been trained with this particular collection of things. How many green block? Ow. Good parrot, two green block, two. Good parrot. One of the things Alex doesn't have is a knee-jerk response to the types of objects that you present him. He can look at two objects and answer several different types of questions about those objects, or he can look at a novel collection of items and answer questions about that collection. What this shows us is that he really understands what those questions mean. So Alex is obviously pretty smart and he has some pretty cool abilities. Alex, first of all, you can note, like in other parrot species a lot of the time, um, can reproduce what sounds like human speech pretty well. And he seems to have some pretty good linguistic abilities as well. He seems to be able to understand some of the questions that he's asked, and these questions have some variety to them, so they're not just all the same. And he also seems to be able to respond appropriately. Especially impressive, at some point he seems to sort of spontaneously ask whether he can return to wherever it is that Alex lives, in a cage or on a pole perhaps, and after that being denied, he then asks to have some water just to be disruptive, if you will. So that seems kind of like he's having some intentions there. However, that's not necessarily what's going on here. And the inference that is often drawn from the case of Alex, namely that Alex must have some real understanding of language and some real understanding of what the questions mean is not necessarily true. The first thing that you as a by now pretty well-trained linguist will probably spot is that all the questions and answers are very templatic, that is, they're very fixed and the parameters in which they can occur are very limited. There's nothing like syntax or anything going on. It's always a task and then a named object that you perform that task on. And then in turn, you have to come up with the right templatically fixed response for that. Now, what that does show us is that Alex must be able to draw inferences based on that input that he's hearing, right? That he can put together different prompts and then look at the world around him and draw some inferences and based on that come up with what is the most appropriate response. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he has any understanding of what the world would have to be like for some sentence to be true, which is one of the measurements that we used to model linguistic meaning, for example. So it's a far cry from saying that Alex understands language or that Alex in some form Form syntax here or understands the relationship between these different things that he's prompted off, that is all fairly fixed. Where all the amazement comes from is the thinking that lies in between getting the question and carrying out the response. And that's really about his cognitive abilities, his abilities to draw inferences and deductions and then voluntarily produce different responses. So it seems the bottom line here is that Alex is pretty smart. But in actuality, as a linguist, we have to say there isn't anything necessarily here that cries out to us that this is linguistic in some way or another, other than perhaps the fact that he's pretty good at imitating those phonetic signs that he's been imparted from his handler. The second case that we're going to look at is that of Chaser, who is a border collie owned by a psychology professor who's taken it upon himself to try and teach Chaser as much vocabulary as he possibly can. So let's have a look at another news report, this time about Chaser, the amazing dog. Walk up, meet Chaser. Walk up, 
beloved six-year-old border collie of psychology oh, professor John Pilly. Good girl. John has taught Chaser to tend an extremely large, if unconventional, herd of a thousand toys. <laughs> and she knows the name of every single one of these? I hope. I find this hard to believe, so I test okay. Chaser's memory okay. with a random sampling. Chaser, find Inky. <laughs> well, she got one right. <laughs> find Seal. Whoa! <laughs> and that one too. In fact, she got all nine right. But what about a new toy she's never seen or heard the name of? Chaser's never seen Darwin, hasn't even ever heard the name Darwin. So we're gonna see if she picks out Darwin by inference. Find Darwin. I have to ask her again. Find Darwin. Darwin, it got Darwin. She did it. Chaser's never seen that doll before, Darwin. yet she settled on the Darwin. one toy she You're didn't know girl. by deduction. It's cool similar girl. to the way children learn language, and dogs like Excellent. Chaser are just Excellent. waiting for us to discover oh all goodness. that they can do. So the example of Chaser also is pretty impressive here. Chaser has successfully managed to learn over a thousand words in vocabulary and associate each of these words with either some command or some object in the world that he's able to pick out. And clearly, as we've seen from the task that he's undertaken, he is clearly aware of all these words and he can draw some inference to find these objects. Specifically, he seems to be able to figure out that he doesn't know the word for some object when he's looking for Darwin and he sees the various objects lying around there and he knows, oh, I don't know what this is, well, that must be that. That seems to involve some kind of inference. And then in addition, he seems to have learned about these objects pretty quickly. So he might have a process that actually humans have as well that we call fast mapping, where from a single exposure, you're able to create a cognitive mapping, a vocabulary to entity pair, if you will, between two things. However, despite Neil deGrasse Tyson's claim here that this is very much like children learning human language, it's actually nothing like children learning human language. Again, this is a case where we can explain everything by classical conditioning and the ability of the animal to draw inference. So again, it shows pretty cool and interesting cognitive abilities and perhaps stretches that farther than we thought was possible with the species of animal. However, it doesn't show anything that we as linguists would classify as really linguistically relevant beyond the point of what we'd already known. Now, despite it being very common in the media to find lots of reports that equate the abilities of animals in studies like this with human language, actually, we haven't found any example yet that has convinced us that animals can do anything that is significantly approaching an ability to possibly understand or use language in a way that is comparable to humans. So to balance this out a little bit, let's look at an area of cognition where animals can teach us something relevant to language that we can't learn from humans. So you might have heard about the forbidden experiment, the idea that if you take a human infant and you completely deprive it of language and all social interaction, then it will grow up, presumably, without the language of its environment and have to rely solely on its universal grammar, on the part of language that is innate. And now we've seen in cases where this has happened involuntarily, for example, in feral children like Genie, that this, of course, leads to all sorts of other damage and that they don't really have any ability to speak from themselves. However, if you took them a couple of generations long and you reintroduced them with each other, so you put language-less people together and then their infants grow up with them so they have social interaction gradually again and they would have to evolve, re-evolve some sort of language ability perhaps, then you could perhaps see what the default language setting would be. Now, unless you're Pharaoh Samtik the first, this is of course something that you cannot do on humans and that is grossly, grossly, grossly immoral. However, it is something that has been done on other animals. It's been done on chimps, where we found that they end up in great psychological despair and these experiments are usually not carried out anymore. However, these experiments are still conducted on certain types of birds. So for example, on the zebra finch, so we'll have a look in a moment at a video clip from a news report showing Offa Chernikovsky, 
who has been carrying out the forbidden experiment with zebra finches. And now the important thing to know about zebra finches is that, first of all, only the male of the species sings. So if you put them together with females, there's no chance that it will learn language from the females. And secondly, their songs are inherited. So they learn the songs of their fathers and their different dialects of songs and so on. So to some degree, the song seems to be learned. A perfect setup, if you will, to carry out the forbidden experiment and see what happens if you deprive a zebra finch of all song input. What uh, speech and language uh, uh, human infants will develop without any exposure to spoken language. Of course, this cannot be done in a human, but why shouldn't we do it uh, with bird? To recreate the conditions of the forbidden experiment, Ofer and his team isolated male chicks away from their fathers before they were taught to sing. Kept in isolation in specially soundproofed cages, their song developed to no more than a croak. One of these isolated males was added to a group of females to create a new finch colony. In the beginning, the first problem that we had is that the females were not very interested in the isolate male. When he starts singing his isolate, unstructured song, they say, yuck. But, uh, but we didn't let go, and we kept going like that with a few tries, and in the end, one female became desperate enough and mated with the isolate founder. And then we had uh, baby birds that imitated their father. The young birds instinctively copied their father's song, despite its unstructured, unattractive sound. And interestingly enough, in isolate song, we see song uh, that may be more prolonged. You can see syllables that go like, like that, instead of choop, choop, choop. And, uh, and this uh, is something that they were still imitating. But when the researchers compared song over the generations, they saw something extraordinary. Each new generation of birds didn't just imitate their father's song, they also improved it. By the fourth generation, the finches were singing a song that normal birds sing, despite none of their colony having ever heard it. We were very pleased to see how quickly normal songs start emerging out of the, those very unstructured songs of the isolates and that the individual bird has this ability to imitate and to improve and improve in, at the level that it makes the song more species-like and perhaps more effective. In the bird, it seems to be somehow encoded so that when they imitate sounds, they'll shift them toward some kind of an internal image that they have of how a good zebra finch song should be like. So what can we learn? from this experiment? Well, first of all, we see that zebra finches that are deprived of any input still develop some form of song, so they seem to have some sort of instinct to be wanting to do that, that seems to be biologically wired in them. And then, secondly, the song that they produce without any input is highly dysfunctional. Even the females don't accept that as a good example of song, and they seem to think perhaps there's something wrong with them, and therefore that's not a good one to mate with. However, over several generations, the song is gradually improved upon and repaired, if you will, to give us a song that fits more closely to the grammar of a good zebra finch song. So there must be an innate component that tells zebra finches about what are the parameters within a good zebra finch song can exist and what is outside of those parameters. So this is very similar to the idea of universal grammar that you might remember that we've introduced all the way back in the very first lecture in this course. So the idea that humans also have some innate component that predetermines some of the parameters and some of the principles of the inviolable universals of human language that language has to confirm to. So the idea here would be that perhaps we can draw an inference here if we did the forbidden experiment on humans over several generations, they would recover something that to us as the Martian scientist in the thought experiment that we used in the first lecture would see as fitting within the parameters of a tested language. So to summarize what we can take away from this is 
First of all, what we've already seen in the last video is that the cognitive and learning abilities in animals may overlap with humans in many linguistically relevant domains. And here especially we saw that, for example, Chaser seems to have something called fast mapping that humans also have and that's very important in language learning. And we've seen that both Chaser and Alex are able to draw inferences. However, animals don't appear to be able to acquire actual language to any significant extent. Their feats can be explained by classical conditioning. And then lastly, what we've seen from the forbidden experiment that was carried out on zebra finches and comparing this to cases such as genie, we can see that both humans and some animals seem to have an innate blueprint for acquiring their communication system. And moreover, that blueprint seems to also determine the valid parameters within which that communication system or the birdsong versus the grammar of a human language can exist.